Well, I'd like to just share part of the first chapter, which introduces the book's main character, Josephine Evans, who we meet while she's having drinks with her friend Howard at a sidewalk cafe in Amsterdam. We were already on our second round of drinks and Howard had shown no sign of calming down. In fact, I think his indignation was rising along with his voice. At least we were sitting outside. That way the noise floated up and away, rather than bouncing off the walls and driving the other patrons crazy. The International Sky Cafe has a nice little patio where you can drink and smoke unmolested, and that's where we had been encamped for the last hour and a half, almost two. The outdoor seating guaranteed the pungent smell of world-class ganja would gently surround anyone passing by, and practically guarantee a contact high if you linger. Marijuana and hashish are legal in Amsterdam, and it's not uncommon to see people sitting in outdoor cafes, reading the newspapers, and having a little smoke with their morning coffee. But Howard and I weren't smoking today. We were ordering champagne by the glass and trying to make sense of what had just happened. I've been thrown out of places for being too black, too queer, too loud, too drunk, too hip, and too, too, but I have never, ever been tossed out on my ass for being too American. Howard was working himself up into a pretty good rant, but we were entitled. We had been asked to lead the funeral of an Iraqi scene designer who had been a close friend of ours for years. The problem was her relatives were there from Baghdad, and the war wasn't just a blurb on the six o'clock news to them. It was real. Even though she died in a boating accident nowhere near a war zone, her family was still outraged at the presence of Americans, any Americans, soldiers or not. It wasn't a question of degrees, Howard, I said. It was a question of citizenship. They were pretty clear about that. No Americans, period. Thirty years ago, our pain at the loss of our friend and our general sorrow about the fucked up state of the world around us might have spun us into a long afternoon of passionate, awkward, just need to feel alive sex. Ending in a good long cuddle, maybe a nap, and an evening out laughing too loud, drinking too much, and not giving a damn. The fact of Howard being unapologetically gay would not have been part of the equation. At those times, it wasn't about gender. It wasn't really even about sex. It was about comfort, connection, and an unequivocal affirmation of life. This happened frequently when too many of my friends were dying of AIDS in the early days of the epidemic. Being a practical sort, even in the midst of panic and confusion, I learned to put my diaphragm in and pack condoms before funerals just in case. Howard was still fussing. I'll tell you one thing, Missy. This is my first and last time being tossed out of somewhere for being an American. An American? Can you believe that? His voice rang with equal parts incredulity and indignation. The very idea that he, William, Howard, Denman, Jr., born and raised on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, could be mistaken for a first-class American citizen was beyond the scope of Howard's experience or comprehension. We were black Americans, after all, not the other kind, and we were not used to being held accountable for their sins. Do I look like John Wayne to you? Howard was on a roll. Can't they see that we're niggas? We spend so much time defining ourselves as outsiders. When we do get invited to the party, sometimes we can't remember why we even wanted to go. I raised my eyebrows at him. Oh, excuse me, Missy. We're Negroes, okay? African Americans, Jigaboos, take your pick. All I'm saying is we're not real Americans. It suddenly occurred to me that in all the confusion, I hadn't had a chance to share my other bad news. It never rains, but it pours. Try telling that to Francois, I said. What are you talking about? Francois knows it. He's been around black folks so long, he's practically an honorary spook himself. If it wasn't for that damn accent, we could pass him off as a Louisiana Creole and nobody would be the wiser. He fired me. Howard was waggling his long, slender fingers at the waiter to indicate we were ready for another round. My words didn't register at first. He what? The waiter, gliding between the tables like a dreadlocked Fred Astaire, nodded to acknowledge Howard's gesture and disappeared. Fired me, I said, draining the last of my champagne in preparation for another. When I turned 50, I decided that the only alcoholic beverage I would consume would be champagne. Now I can spend all that time I used to waste looking at the wine list, looking for a new job. Howard frowned at me across the tiny table. He can't fire you. Well, he took me into his office, closed the door, took my hand and told me the board wasn't renewing my contract. What would you do? The board, Howard snorted derisively, 
That's absurd, beyond absurd. Since when does the board make artistic decisions? They wouldn't even have a theater if it wasn't for you. And Francois would still be directing those wretched little pieces he used to do in that awful space down by the train station. It was an awful space. And most of the work that was presented there was distinguished by its passionate intensity, not its artistic excellence. I did some good work there. Exactly. You did. Not Francois and the rest of that crowd. You. Howard snapped his fingers for emphasis as the waiter appeared with our drinks, scooped up our empties, and then stopped to peer at me quizzically. I know that look. He just realized that he'd seen me in a movie or at a film festival or on a stage somewhere. The fact that the idea that I could have stopped in to have a few too many glasses of champagne in the cafe where he happened to be working was not something he had ever considered. In New York or LA, I could walk down the street stark naked and not get the time of day. But here in Amsterdam or London, Paris, even Rome on a good day, I'm a recognizable face, if not a household name. You're a bona fide star, Missy. What possible reason could he give for firing you, Howard said, not even noticing the waiter? Would you believe for being an American? Howard choked on his drink and started coughing like a maniac. Excuse me, the waiter said seeing his break and jumping in before Howard could catch his breath. Yes? I'm sorry, but the waiter was ignoring the presence of other thirsty customers as if we were alone in the room. But are you, are you Josephine Evans, the actress? As opposed to Josephine Evans, the pig farmer. I nod, smile, reach out to shake his free hand. Yes, I am. Thank you, he said, his eyes filling up with tears. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, you're very welcome, I said, wondering what I had done to deserve such unabashed adoration. Howard, fully recovered, was grinning at me like the Cheshire Cat. So, you know Ms. Evans' work? The waiter nodded. Oh, yes. I've seen every play you've done since 1992. You're the reason I became an actor. An actor slash waiter, I thought. How old were you in 1992? He looked like he was barely old enough now to be legally serving us drinks. I was 10, he said sounding breathless and amazed. We were in a play together. That could only mean one thing. The only play I've ever done with children was Medea, and I got to kill them at the end. <laughs> a lot of actors will tell you never to work with kids or animals because they're too cute or too fidgety, and in either case, you can't compete. I thought that was good advice the first time I heard it, and I still do, but the kids are only on stage for a minute or two in Medea, and she's so wonderfully crazed by then, there is no way any kid even a seriously cute or terminally twitchy one can compete with that. Medea, right? He nodded. Were you my son? Yes, he almost gasped in his delight. I was the older one, the one she stabs first. I can't <laughs> believe you remember me after all these years. She never forgets a line or a face, Howard said, reaching in his pocket for a pen and a piece of paper, which he slid across the table to me. He knew the drill. Smile, acknowledge, autograph, say goodbye. Well, my son, you grew up nice, I said, teasing him gently, pen poised above the scrap Howard had provided. Would you like an autograph? Oh, would you mind, he said, still ignoring the increasingly impatient people nearby, hoping to catch his eye for a refill. What's your name, I said, unprepared for the crestfallen look my question elicited. Oh, my God, I thought, this sweet baby actually thinks I remember his name after 15 years. I twinkled at him in a way that once would have been flirtatious, but since I'm old enough to be his mother, was now only sweetly conspiratorial. You know how we theater people are, I said apologetically. I only remember your character's name. Do you want me to sign it that way? His smile returned. Yes, of course, that would be fine. Oh, no, that's not good. Then no one will know it's me. You better go on and make it to Julian. To Julian, I wrote, a great actor and a wonderful son, your loving mother, Medea, slash Josephine. He read it, smiled as if we now had an official private joke, bowed slightly and backed away as if he were leaving the presence of royalty. See, that's what I mean, Howard said, taking a sip of his champagne. About what? The exchange had been pleasant, even routine, but suddenly I felt exhausted. The events of the last two days had finally caught up with me. I considered going back on my resolution and ordering up a vodka on the rocks with a splash of lime, but I don't want to be unemployed and drunk on the same day. <laughs> About the idea of them firing you being beyond absurd. 
They fired you. He snorted again. Everybody fires me. It's part of my process. Now tell me, Francois, exact words. Your firing makes a much better story than mine, I said, trying to move on. Howard raised one eyebrow in a way people who didn't know him found intimidating. His exact words, Missy. I couldn't resist trying to lighten the moment by doing the accent. Francois was a Frenchman raised in Spain who had been living in Greece for a decade before we arrived in Amsterdam on the same rainy afternoon almost 30 years ago. He walked up to meet me at the airport, looking very hip and European, told me he was a director and asked if I was an actress. Oh, of course I was. I fell in love with him immediately. We lived together off and on for five or six years. At that point, we decided to stop driving each other crazy and just be friends. In an attempt to be all things to all people, not one of his finer qualities, Francois deliberately rolled all his accents into one so that nobody could quite figure out where he was from. I'm a citizen of the world, was his habitual response to direct questions, and most people let it go at that. That's one of the best things about theater people. It's our job to make stuff up. Characters, accents, costumes, the specifics of real time, real place, are less important to us than the integrity of heart and the sweetness of soul. Nobody held Francois's accent against him. We had all come from somewhere else. Many of us had come from someone else. But once we found each other, we became members of the same tribe. The most passionate relationships we ever had occurred in the context of rehearsal and performance. Our lives outside the theater often seemed flamboyant and extravagant. But that was only because when you spend three hours a night doing Shakespeare, Ibsen, Sophocles, Wilson, Hansberry. You have to live your real life at that emotional level too or risk boring yourself to death until showtime. If anyone appreciated the necessity of reinvention, Howard and I did. Plus, we both loved Francois, even after he had sent us packing. You can't just forget all those years of friendship, love, struggle, collaboration, and sex just because the world is going stone crazy and there isn't a damn thing you and your friends can do about it. Josephine, I said, exaggerating the famous accent until I sounded like a combination of Pepe Le Pew, the cartoon skunk who thinks he's Charles Boyer, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the actor who thinks he's the governor of California. <laughs> you know I love you, Howard groaned. He didn't go there, did he? I plowed ahead. But we've gotten some calls at the theater, some letters, the board just thinks this isn't a good time to have an American actress as part of our repertory company. They're afraid it sends the wrong message. The wrong message to whom? Do they think you set American foreign policy in between your performances? I was still doing Francois's farewell speech, but it wasn't as funny as I hoped it would be. You know, Josephine, I would not be where I am today if it hadn't been for you. Hm. At least he had the guts to say it, but he didn't have the guts not to do it, I said in my own voice, amazed to feel my eyes filling up. Fuck him, Howard said, pretending he didn't see me blinking back the tears. Be sure you tell Francois that next time you see him, will you? They don't deserve you. I took another swallow of champagne to soothe my frazzled nerves. At least it wasn't personal. Seems that we're now citizens of a country that everybody wishes would just go away. Can't you teach classes or something, Howard said? I looked at him. What? You'd be a fabulous teacher. I'm a fabulous actress, remember? I don't have the patience to teach. Maria Callas gave private lessons. Callas was Howard's favorite opera singer of all time. But the Greek diva's voice classes were legendary for making mincemeat of those who came to worship her. She made people cry and slash their wrists, I reminded him. Nobody slashed their wrists. That's only because they had to leave all sharp objects at the door, I said. <laughs> okay, okay, he said, I get it. Teaching is out. So what are you going to do? The truth was, the funeral had come up so quickly on the heels of my firing that I hadn't had time to really consider the question. It would take me a minute to process the possibilities and come up with a plan that would feed me creatively and put champagne on the table. I opened my mouth to tell Howard that I'd get back to him with an answer as soon as I had one when I heard myself say, maybe it's time to go home. Howard immediately glanced around for our waiter. All right, sweetie, I know it's been a hell of a long day. One more drink and I'll walk you. No, I said quietly, I mean home. His hand froze in midway. To America? I nodded. The idea so unexpected was settling in like I had invited it. 
Because of the funeral, he said? Because of Francois' foolishness? I shook my head. No, none of that, really, or all of it. I don't know. I just feel like I need to go home. How long will you stay, Howard said. I shrugged. I don't know. A couple of months? Maybe longer. Howard looked at me and frowned. How much longer? He knew me too well. I leaned across the table and took his hands. I'm thinking it might be time for me to make a move, ma chérie. What kind of move? Back to Atlanta. Howard looked at me like I had said I was considering moving to Mars. Are you serious? I think I am. Maybe you're just high. Too much champagne on an empty stomach. If I was high, I'd be trying to figure out how to pass for Puerto Rican so I could get my old job back, I said. Howard shook his head. I don't see how you can consider moving back to a country where you can't even smoke a joint with your cappuccino in the morning. It's not civilized. I didn't say it was civilized, I said. I said it was home. He squeezed my hands gently, turned them palm up and kissed each one lightly. His lips were warm and dry. I thought this was home, ma chérie. I thought so too, but not anymore. No, not anymore. There it was, the truth, out of nowhere. Undeniable. It was time to go home. We just looked at each other for a minute. We'd been friends for so long. The idea of not having our regular coffee and croissant at the start of every day was an inconceivable. It was as if we were both suddenly unemployed. His eyes searched mine for some indication that I was open to persuasion and found none. How can you even think of leaving me here alone, he said. Come with me. Howard shook his head. Not me. I promised the ghost of Langston Hughes that if I ever got my black ass out of Chicago, they wouldn't have to worry about Howard Denman anymore. As long as I stay here, I'm living the life I dreamed about. Back there, I'm just one more black faggot with a little style. <laughs> you could never be just one more anything, I said. Could you? I don't know, I said. How about one more glass of champagne? Your wish is my command. He waved to Julian, our waiter slash actor, who was already hovering with a bottle of something French, which he said was on the house. You think they're gonna treat you this good over there? Howard said, when Julian had poured us two glasses, made another small bow, and disappeared. They better, I said, or do you know what? What sweetness. I'll hop right back on the plane that brought me, come back here and make you find me a job. You better, he said, his voice cracking just a little. Jesus, I didn't even cry at the damn funeral. You didn't have time, I said, we got tossed out too fast. Howard grimaced. What a day. That already seems like a hundred years ago. A hundred years and counting. Over the next two hours, what had started off as an angry drowning of our sorrows evolved into a wonderfully teary bon voyage party and a picture-perfect ending to an absolutely terrible day. Well, let's have one more toast before we drag our drunk asses home, Howard said, dividing the last corner of the dark green bottle between us. Good idea, I said. What are we toasting? Here's to being real Americans, he raised his glass and grinned across the table at me. Who knew? so that they can have it for the um, filming they're doing. And the question is, um, talk a little bit about that setting, about Amsterdam. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time there. I was in Amsterdam one time um, and actually did spend a, a lovely morning in the International Sky Cafe and was completely amazed when they asked me, would you like cappuccino or you know, coffee or espresso, all the things they ask you at Starbucks. But then when they get done taking that order, they say, would you like something to smoke? And if you say yes, they give you a menu that has 
all different kinds of hashish, all different kinds of marijuana, just like it would be cappuccino at Starbucks, which is a very interesting lesson in just the power of law. Because in our country, if you did that, you'd be arrested immediately. You cannot sit at the Starbucks at 285 in Cascade Road and smoke a joint with your morning cappuccino. But in Amsterdam, you can. And it was the most um, interesting, civilized environment. You know, there were very old people sitting there reading the international newspapers, smoking dope and drinking cappuccino. There were young people trying to get their bus fare together, drinking their espresso and smoking marijuana. So that it was a very interesting um, environment for me just because it was so different um, than anything that I had known here. Um, I was there actually to um, cover a, a Diana Ross concert for Essence. And I had stopped flying. I hate airplanes, so I hadn't been flying for a long time. And they asked me if I would, first of all, go to Amsterdam, which I had always wanted to do, and then go to, you know, interview Diana Ross. I mean, I'm from Detroit. So when they tell you to go interview Diana Ross and you're a girl from Detroit, you go interview Diana Ross. <laughs> so I did spend about a week there. Um, and it was a, enough to really kind of give me the, the feeling. She doesn't spend much of the book in Amsterdam, so I had enough to, to make it a real place. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're looking at me so hard. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, how do I find the process of playwriting different than writing a novel? Um, I think that the main difference is that theater is a very collaborative art. So that even though when you're writing the play, you're by yourself because you have to eventually stop just telling the story to your friends and go sit somewhere and write it down. Um, once you get done with that script and you give it to someone who decides they want to produce it, it becomes a very collaborative um, situation. You have a director, you have designers, you have actors, you have producers, you have all of those people there together. Um, so that the work that you get to do is very different because you get to not only have the work that you've done, but also to share the work of other collaborative theater artists. So that if you're working with other wonderful artists, they bring so much to the work um, that you do. Um, so that as a playwright, you know, you, um, you go to rehearsal and you hear the play read out loud by actors and you hear things that you may not have heard as you were writing the play. So that part of it is, is really wonderful. Um, the other part of the collaboration is with the audience. Once the play is done, you invite people in to come and see it. So that you are then part of the collaborative experience of those people watching it all at the same time, which is very different than the experience of a novel. You write a novel by yourself, you send it off into the world. All of you all get it and take it home and read it um, pretty much by yourselves. Um, book clubs kind of address that, but not in the same way that theater does. Because even with the book clubs, if you actually do the assignment, you're supposed to have read the book by the time you get to the book club meeting. Um, with theater, we all experience it new for the first time, which is a wonderful, wonderful kind of thing. Um, the thing that was the, the most difficult for me, moving into fiction, was that um, writing a play, you can say, it's Harlem, it's 1930, um, it's mid-afternoon, and they're in an apartment. And then the designers have to make it look like that. They have to find the book that shows what apartments look like in Harlem in 1930. They have to find the gels to put on the lighting instrument to make it look like a balmy summer afternoon. As a novelist, I have to do that. I have to make you see that same setting. Um, by myself, in words, rather than, you know, getting costumes and getting actors. It's all the words on the page. So that, that was kind of intimidating to me um, when I first started. Um, but the, the advantage that you have, I think, is that you have complete control as a novelist. If you write it on the page and you like it, every time someone reads it, it's going to be exactly what you wrote. If you write a play and you get a great cast and a great director and fabulous designers, it's going to be even better than what you had in your head. But sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes you get people who want to do theater, but they're not that good at doing theater. Sometimes they don't have money to build the kind of set that you wish that we always had money enough to build. So that it's a different experience for the audience based on what comes um, to them. Um, as a playwright, I really had to learn that um, lesson about not having expectations that make it impossible for you to enjoy your work when it's not produced at a, at a level um, that money makes possible. Um, and it was to me to have some experiences with very small community theaters who didn't have those kinds of resources, but who had people who loved theater so much they would work all day, had a job that paid the rent, and then come and learn the lines and do the work and call the people in. So that it, it really made me appreciate those productions as much as you do the ones that 
that are the perfect ones where you say, wow, that looks even better than I thought it would. But when you see people who are doing theater, not because they've got unlimited budgets, not because they think they're going to be rich and famous, but because they really love it, I think that's a real gift to the playwright, too. Yes, ma'am. Um, do I have plans to write any more plays? Yes, I do. I actually um, had uh, just written a play that closed at seven stages a couple weeks ago um, called A Song for Coretta. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, which I, I wrote um, after Coretta King passed. I, um, like many of us, was watching the coverage um, on the news. And I remember turning on the TV late one night, it was the 11 o'clock news, it was very late, and people were standing outside of Ebenezer um, in the rain. It was not a typical Atlanta evening. It was cold and rainy and just a, a, a really nasty kind of evening. And people were all the way down the street, around the corner, around the block, waiting to just go in and pass in front of them um, where she was lying in state and pay their respects. And I was so moved by um, their patience standing there. Nobody was fussing. Nobody Nobody was arguing, nobody was mad, nobody was doing that thing where you look around and try to see the head of the line and all of that. Everybody was very calm, they were talking about her to each other. Um, and it was just very moving to me that all these people who didn't know her were standing there in the rain for hours to say goodbye to her. And so I wrote the play, I made up five imaginary characters, women standing in line waiting. Um, and they all became, if any of you have ever waited in line for tickets or shows or whatever it is, you know that for that brief amount of time, you become a little community of people. You know, you talk to people like you're going to know them forever, then you go into the show, you never see them again. So the play was kind of that. It was these five women in line. Um, and I had a great experience with it. I, we did it for the first time at Spelman when I was teaching at Spelman, and it was wonderful. And then they did a really wonderful production in seven stages. So I'm, I'm definitely going to write some more plays. I really missed it. Yeah. What's your schedule? What's my process? What's my schedule for writing? Um, I'm not one of those people who can do the page quotas a day. I have a lot of friends who drive themselves crazy with that. You know, I've got to do 30 good pages a day, and it's like, maybe you don't have 30 good pages a day. Maybe you have two today and 100 tomorrow. You know, you, you don't know. But that works for some people to give themselves those kinds of deadlines. Um, I don't do um, that kind of thing. What I try to do is to have a routine. Um, I try to write um, every day, um, and when I'm working on a project, I try to work from like 10 in the morning until about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Um, after that, I find that it's, it really gets to where you're pushing yourself too hard, but after I've written for that amount of time, most of what I'm going to push myself to do, I'm going to have to throw away in the morning anyway. Um, so I, um, I like to get up in the morning, read the paper, um, sit with my husband, drink our coffee, fuss about the president, um, and then get to work. Um, so that it's, it's really the, the part that's the most important to me is to just do it every day. And then I find that the pages that you need emerge if you will present yourself to that desk, sit down in front of that paper um, every day. And that's really the most important thing um, to me is that routine. Um, I think that sometimes when people um, put too much pressure on themselves um, for pages or for deadlines or for all of those kinds of things that, that we sometimes have to have to do. Oftentimes that um, works against the freedom that you need to feel to actually go ahead and do it. Um, so that if I um, can get to my desk every day, um, then I really find that the page is better, you know, if I can sit there long enough. Yeah. yeah. So I'll come up. Um, how much of your personal How much of my personal experience shows up in the books? Um, I could personal human. Well, all of um, I think what shows up in terms of emotions and how you think about the world and point of view and all that. Um, I think it's all through everything um, that I write. Um, the questions that I'm looking at, you know, those four questions were actually the four questions that drove this book. Um, so that the questions that I'm always asking myself that are answered by the books or by the plays um, always, of course, bring in, you know, what I'm worried about, what I'm thinking about, what makes me happy, what makes me sad. Um, so that I'm, I'm very much um, present in all of these characters. Um, I try not to base the characters in the books on actual people. Um, the only person that I steal from shamelessly is my husband, who gives me permission to do that. I always ask. Um, but I, I use a lot of things from him um, in the male characters in the books. Otherwise, I really try to, you know, to imagine these people 
um, from scratch because that's that's really what my job is. The other thing is if you base the things that you're doing too much on real people, they always know that it's there. You know? Even though if the person in real life is like five, six, and you make them five, two, they know that it's them. And it doesn't matter if you think you did a really wonderful um, character and you think this person is really smart and you know beautiful and courageous and all those things. No one ever thinks that you have gotten it right if you write about them. They always think they're smarter than that. <laughs> they're more beautiful than that. They're more resourceful than that. So that if you really want to keep your friends and be a writer, I have found that the best thing is to, to make things up, you know, to, to do the work that we're supposed to do, which is to, to imagine, you know, to look out the window and, and figure out what your imagination can feed you about these people. This sounds like a presidential press conference. May I have a follow-up question? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, you can. Absolutely. No press. <laughs> skinned African American okay. person. But I'm I'm an African American person so that there's never been any confusion about that for me. Um, so that there's any you know if there is ever any confusion it's because someone seeing me may not immediately recognize that I'm an African American person. Um, and my mother helped us deal with that as very small children, which is to say, if someone has a case of mistaken identity, you correct them as quickly as you can. And then if, there's, if they're angry with you about the fact that you are an African American, then it's their ignorance, not yours, leave them alone. So that the, the idea of having confusion about, am I this or am I that, I never had that. Um, it's, race is a very complicated issue in this country, but I think it's usually a lot simpler um, than we make it. And in my case, it's, it's only mistaken identity, but no confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you speak about your experience with Oprah and Legends Ball? Okay. Um, can I say something about my experience with Oprah and the Legends Ball and the poem, um, we speak your names? Um, she uh, decided to do, a couple years ago, Oprah Winfrey decided to do a weekend at her home where she honored uh, 25 legendary African-American women um, in politics and the arts. Um, everybody from um, Diana Ross to Dorothy Hyde, just a, a wonderful um, group of women. Um, and she was also asking uh, 45 women who were a little younger um, to come and be a part of this celebration, to honor them, to, to let them know how much we all appreciate them. Um, and she was calling that um, younger group the youngins. Um, so she called me and asked me if I would be a part of that group. So I was very flattered because I had two grandchildren. So for someone to call me a youngin was like, okay, I can do this. Um, and then she asked me if I thought that I could write something that would speak on behalf of all of us to these women. Um, so that's kind of a dream assignment, right? I mean, that's Oprah Winfrey saying, can you please write something about these women that you've loved and admired all your life and then say it in front of them. So of course I agreed um, to do that. And she sent me the name of um, the names of the 25 women um, that we were honoring. Um, and all of them were women that I already knew about, already admired, had grown up reading about, listening to, and saying all of those things. So that the, um, the piece itself actually didn't take a long time um, to write because it's, you know, I would say maybe two or three times in my life have I ever had an experience where I felt like I was kind of channeling something. You know, I wish I was one of those writers where, you know, you hear voices and then you just write it down. I don't get that. But for, for this piece, I felt like I had a chance to say something that so many of us had wanted to say um, to these women, so it just kind of came forward. Um, and I sent it to her and she liked it. Um, and asked me, you know, if I would read it and have some of the other women read with me. So that's what we did. Um, she had a lunch in the first day and we read the poem, just us, just the youngins and the legends. And we read the uh, poem to them and it was wonderful. I mean, they wept and laughed with us and hugged us and all of that. And I really was struck by the fact that I think so many of these women don't have any idea how much we love them. 
I mean, I don't think Leontine Price had any idea how much we love her. I don't think that a lot of these women, even though they're renowned for what they do, had really felt um, emotionally what it was that they meant to all of us. So that it was a real gift to me and a real privilege to be able to, to stand in front of them and say, you know, you made a space for us to be standing here and we love you, we appreciate you. So it was a wonderful thing for me. What advice would I give to an unpublished author? A new published author. Um, go everywhere you can and read to people, talk to people. Um, go to the bookstores if you can um, and talk to the people there. Go any place you can get two or more people to gather together <laughs> and talk to them about your book. Um, really, I think that sometimes um, we expect more um, to happen without us making that happen because we work so hard to write the book that once it's done, you feel like, okay, somebody's going to handle this. The publisher's going to do it. My publicist is going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. It's going to be you. So you have to kind of take a moment when you finish the book and really celebrate yourself as a writer. You know, do whatever you do to celebrate and say, I did good. I wrote this 200, 300, however many pages it is and celebrate it and then go to bed, get up in the morning, and become your own publicist. Don't think about yourself as the artist who is having to drag out and take this book around. Think about the fact that this is another part of you, another part of your brain that is working for you. So you're really, as the publicist, working for the artist. And then it's not as confusing, because it's, it's difficult to, you know, just sell your own work and to pitch your own work and all that. So it's, I have found it to be helpful to kind of separate on that part of, of your brain out so that then the artist doesn't feel like, why are you making me go talk to these strangers? You know, because you're the publicist going to talk to the bookstore owner. You know, you're the person who's finding out where the book clubs meet and asking them if they'd be interested in you coming to talk about your book. Um, but just keep, keep talking about it. You, know, you spend all that time writing about it. Spend that much time and effort talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what do I, what, um, considering especially my father, what is my reaction to, um, to the Jeremiah Wright um, story, the media's response? Um, my father um, was a very, very radical um, minister. Um, and it was, I was just saying to, to my friend over here that we, in looking at these uh, clips that they're using, um, where people are saying, oh, that's so incendiary, we can't believe he said this, we can't believe he said this. He's in a tradition that my father is also in. So I understand everything about that tradition. I understand what he was talking about. I understand who he was talking to um, and all of that. So I think that the media's response um, is disingenuous, you know, to act like race is not a very complicated problem. And to act like in this year, we don't know that there is a different dialogue that goes on in black communities than there is that goes on in white communities. You know, we all know this. When we're in integrated settings, we don't talk the same way we do when we're only among our own people. And which isn't to say we talk bad about other folks, but we talk different about other folks, you know, and that's, that's the fact of it. So um, my father actually published a, um, a book of his sermons um, many years ago, and the publisher was a little nervous that white people would think these were, you know, incendiary and all the things that they've been saying about um, Reverend Wright. And at the end of the introduction, when he was talking about what these sermons were doing, my father um, said, um, these sermons were preached to black congregations, white people who read these sermons, are being permitted to listen to a black man talking to black people. Which I thought was so perfect for this same thing because it's like, if you haven't been invited into the conversation, then you're just eavesdropping. And it really isn't fair. If you want to be a part of that conversation, then it's very important to be a part of the conversation. Don't take two seconds of what this man said and base your response on that. He's been talking for 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. Take all of that, read the book, go to the church, listen to what he has to say. So I think it's, it's part of that, you know, that thing that we sometimes hear in this country when people say, oh my God, I can't believe that you know, somebody talked about race. I can't believe somebody actually was angry about race. You know, I, mean, I, I think that's crazy after all of this you know, time that we don't acknowledge that there's still a lot of anger, there's still a lot of rage, there's still a lot of confusion. I mean, this is my second time at the Margaret Mitchell House, um, but the first time I came, which was the last time I was here, it was like a big deal for me because I had real problems with Gone with the Wind. Not as a book, but as an apology for slavery. I mean, you know, at the beginning, I know y'all have seen the movie, and at the beginning it says, you know, this is, a, um, you know, those beautiful days, and they're gone, and they were so wonderful and all that, and I'm saying, not for us. <laughs> <laughs> it was so wonderful for us. So that it's, 
it's the, you know, that becomes an incendiary thing to say, you know, if you take it out of context. And I'm saying, you know, Miss Scarlet can just kiss my all of that, then, you know, it becomes something else other than saying it's a complicated thing to be a little black girl, 11 years old, on the all black west side of Detroit, reading Gone with the Wind. Who am I supposed to identify with? I was identifying with Scarlett, just like all of y'all were. And my mother pointed out to me that that was really not appropriate. That, you know, that I needed to be identified with Chrissy. I needed to be identified with Mammy, which of course, no little black girl on the west side of Detroit wanted to identify with being a slave to a white woman. So you had to read the book with that double consciousness that Du Bois talks about, you know, where you say, this is crazy, and I'm not gonna let my mom and dad see me reading it, but I gotta find out what happens to Rip. I gotta find out what Miss Melanie is gonna do, and all the slave owners that they made us love, because she can write so well. So that it's, you know, the, the fact that I've made peace with that, and I'm, I'm here again, is, you know, just part of how complicated um, race is. But that's, I was so um, disturbed by it, because Reverend Wright does remind me of my father, and does remind me of my father's work, and of that whole, generation of black ministers and the important work that they did. Um, which is why when I saw the very thoughtful um, presentation that Barack Obama made, I was just, you know, I cried sitting in my own house, you know, watching TV, <laughs> which is very rare. But it was, it was exactly what we need to have happen if we're going to talk honestly about race. We've got to have somebody who's not scared of it. And that's actually part of what this book is about. You know, trying to say, what does it mean to be a black American? You know, how do we how do we make that work for us? And I never felt like I was a part of this country until I was driving back from Miss Oprah's house and driving across the country, which my husband had tried to get me to do for years. And I had never done it because I was scared to be out there where Iowa and Idaho and all that. I'm folk out there. I did not want to go. But then when he finally convinced me to do it, it was the most amazing, life-changing trip I've ever had. Everybody we met was wonderful. We stopped in any little town we wanted to stop in. I mean, little motels in Texas, Oklahoma, Amarillo, all those places. And every single person we met was lovely. Every exchange was wonderful. You know, and plus, it's a beautiful country. I've never been out in the country. I grew up in Detroit, went to school in D.C., moved to Atlanta. You know, you go to the airports, one airport to the other. You don't see the snow-capped mountains. You don't see the Great Plains. You don't see how beautiful it is. So that I got to see how beautiful the people were. I got to see how beautiful the country was. And somewhere around Amarillo, Texas, I said to myself, well, you know, this country doesn't really belong to George Bush. This is my country, too. I was born here. This is the only one I got. So can I claim it? Is it legitimate for me as a black American to claim it and to love it and to try to work with it? You know, so I'm thinking about those things in writing this book, and then we get Barack Obama. So I'm just a wreck. You know, I'm like, okay, can we really do it? You know, can we really have a country where people tell the truth to each other? You know, where they try to think of other ways to talk about the issues that drive us all crazy. And I think we can. Um, and I'm determined to be a part of that. Don't let me start preaching up here. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's my dad's influence. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Think about mixed race people as opposed to black people. Well, I think the uh, the, the question about um, mixed race, you know, how do we describe ourselves? Um, I think that's part of what the conversation has to be about. Because if you say to someone who has a, a white mother and a black father, you are now black, then what do they do with their mom? How do they how do they incorporate their mom into that? And I had a student at Spelman who came to me in tears one time who had a white mother, black father. And you know, I said, What's wrong? What's wrong? Are you okay? And she said that the, the several of the people in her dorm had really fussed at her about her mother. You know, about you know, you got a white mother and you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And I said, anyone who ever advises you to reject your mother is not a friend of yours. Leave them alone. No one is supposed to tell you to reject your mother because she's white. I mean, that's the madness of race in America. How can you possibly do it? So I think what we call ourselves, you know, do we say we're black? Do we say we're mixed? Do we say we're American? Do we say we're... I think that's all part of 
what this discussion is. You know, it's the same as the feminist discussion. Do we as black women embrace the word feminist? Do we call ourselves feminist? Do we call ourselves Alice Walker's word, which is womanist? You know, do we call ourselves free Amazons? Do we call ourselves, you know, whatever it is. But I think what we say when we describe ourselves um, is less important to me than how we behave. You know, we can call ourselves almost anything if we just act like human beings. You know. mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I noticed you said you went to school in D.C. Mm -hmm. I was wondering which school you went to. I went to Howard for three okay. years. Um, that's right. Go by. Okay. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Howard. That's right. I went to Howard for three years and I came here and finished this film. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I loved Howard. It was a good place. And I was at, um, in D.C. in the mid-60s, so it was a perfect place for a radical person like me because we could just pick at anybody at any time. <laughs> Let's go down to the White House and pick at the president. Let's go down to Congress and tell them what we think about it. So it was a great experience for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you had one more opportunity to Um, do, the, uh, do I have a target audience in mind for the books and do they transcend race? Um, um, the audience that I always have in mind when I'm writing um, is, a, is a room full of conscious black women who are about the same age as I am. The reason for that is not that I feel like that's the only audience for my writing, but that I feel like that audience will give me permission to tell the truth, to say whatever I want. Um, there's a lot of people who will advise you not to talk about this, not to talk about that. That's death for a writer. You've got to find something in you that gives you permission to tell it, whatever it is. And for me, that's a, that's a mental picture of a group of, of conscious black women in a room together. Um, but I think that um, any good book, any good piece of, of literature, any good piece of art, is going to talk to people beyond the specifics of that artist. Um, you know, I've read all kinds of books by all kinds of, of people, and I have related to the, the things that are in the books because we're all, as human beings, pretty much writing about the same thing. You know, there's only five or six stories that we ever tell as writers. You know, we tell love stories, we tell family stories, um, we tell bad guys on the, on the move stories, but there's, there's really not a, a thousand stories that we tell, so that I think any story told well about human beings um, has an opening for other human beings um, to find it. Um, during um, a long period of my life, um, I refused to read any books by white males because I was a, a budding feminist, so I was really angry at men. And I was a black nationalist, so I had a bone to pick with white people. So white men were definitely on my list. I'm not reading any of their books. And I realized, um, you know, after a certain point, that that was really um, separating people in a way that I don't believe in. You know, I've read some wonderful books written by white men. I mean, I, I, I didn't like the movie of No Country for Old Men, but I thought the book was amazing. And that definitely is a, a white male writer. So I think that what I'm always conscious of is giving myself permission to tell whatever the stories I have are, because if I tell them right, they're going to be stories that will resonate for other human beings. Mm -hmm. You're trying to find your own voice and trying to, I think that one of the difficulties um, that, you're, that you're having um, is allowing other people's opinions to matter too much. Um, everyone, as you're writing a book, is going to have an opinion about how you ought to do it. You're not, and you know this is true, right? That, that people will have a way to tell you how to do it, um, which is very dangerous for a writer. You have to write what's in your head. They have to write their own story. And whatever it is you think should be in that book, 
put it in there. Unless it's someone that you absolutely trust, like an editor who knows what you're trying to do, knows the form, knows the craft, then I think you can have a discussion where you allow them to talk to you about what it is you're doing. But with other writers who are also learning, as you're learning to find their own voice, it can be dangerous because the advice they give you might take you further from your voice um, rather than bringing you closer. I would recommend a book to you about writing called Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Um, and it's a, you know, like $10 paperback, but it's a very good book um, just about the process, about the craft. She has a really good sense of humor, so it doesn't overwhelm you um, with a lot of real serious analysis, but it, it has exercises that will get you past that moment where you don't know what you're supposed to do next. It has wonderful questions that will help you get to the heart of the matter of what you're looking at. I'm sorry, I just, she was giving me a sign that we've only got time for a couple more questions. One more question. Go ahead. Oh, you mean promoted in terms of like, oh, I don't, I'm, um, that's a difficult question. Um, see me afterward, um, but I'm, I'm not real helpful on that just because I don't really know how to do that. <laughs> but see me afterward, okay? Okay, this will be our last one. Yes, then. Wow. That's just a just more easy question to finish up with. How do you, how do you inspire middle school students to write? Um, I would not presume, um, you're, you, are, you are the teacher you're talking about, right? I wouldn't presume to tell you um, how to do that um, because I'm not, uh, I have never tried to teach middle school um, and I know that is a, a serious job um, that you're doing. Um, I don't really um, know what to tell you except that I've always found in working with young writers that the more you can get them to write about themselves, the more you can get them to write about what they have experienced and what they know, um, and look at it without um, judging them, the more they'll begin to open up and, and write about what they want. The difficulty is the non-judgmental part, because some of the things they write, you know, you want to, yes, I know, you want to correct it and change it and say, don't think about it that way, don't think about it this way. But I think um, trying to get them to write about themselves is the, the only way that I have really been able to work with, with younger writers to get them to try to, to really put some stuff on paper. That's the truth. Otherwise, they're always trying to write what you think, you know, what they think you want rather than who they really are. I appreciate all of you being here um, so much. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to sign any books that you've got. Right